All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Ahmad Monawar, who is in Toronto, Canada. How are you doing, Ahmad? Doing really, really well, John. Good to be here. Yeah, and Ahmad is the founder of Boutique Growth. He said most consultants struggle with marketing, lead generation and business development because they haven't taken the time to master the marketing of their expertise. So we're going to talk today about how to fill your pipeline with five and six figure consulting deals without begging for referrals. And as we were just talking briefly before we came on air, a lot of it has to do with exactly what you're saying, mastering the marketing and positioning, Ahmad. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, when we talk about filling your pipeline with deals, I think people might be thinking we're going to get very tactical. I'm going to show you the hack and the tool and the widget mm -hmm. and uh, you know, the, 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 the silver bullet that just opens up pipelines and fills them with deals and makes sales easy. And unfortunately there's no silver bullet. There's the very hard, but important work of defining why the heck the customer should choose you to begin with. And we call that power positioning. Power positioning is adopting a position in the marketplace such that you are for the customers that you choose to serve, which is hopefully fairly specific and narrow and focused, you are the only viable choice for that market. When you do that, what happens is the clients and the prospects in the market begin to see you as somebody, an organization, if you, if you will, in a league of their own right? There's two options. There's you and there's everybody else. And they have confidence in you and not a lot of confidence in the other options. And that's the, kind of the key, the key piece that we teach our clients inside of our programs. Yeah. And, and one of the things I think that's tempting, and, you know, uh, particularly with, um, you know, small business or startup business or consulting businesses or, or whatever, is that uh, they tend to go broad just because, you know, initially they just think any business is good business. So rather than doing what you're talking about, really spending a lot of time on figuring out the ideal target customer and, and as you said, power positioning, they tend to go broad and then try to pull back to be more specific. And that's maybe not a bad idea, right? It really depends on the stage of the business. So we have lots of clients that come in who are early days. They just left their corporate job or, you know, they're, they're new to business, new to consulting. And, you know, I can't tell them, okay, these are the only types of deals that you want to take on because they're really aligned with your sweet spot. And, you know, to hell with your bills and to hell with the rent and putting food on the table. You can't do that. Right. But, mm -hmm. but what we do do is we draw this distinction between the deals that you want and the deals that you take. Right. Right. You want to be clear on the deals that you want. That is the deals that are aligned with your positioning and your sweet spot and the clients that you can serve and who you can do your best work for at the highest price and lowest amount of effort. We want to be clear on that because if we're not clear on that, we're never going to win those deals. We're never going to get there. Right. And those are the deals we go out and we pursue very deliberately. But that doesn't mean that you can't take on another deal that's outside of your sweet spot, especially in the early days where you need to pay the bills. You certainly want to get to a point where you only take on deals that are in your sweet spot. But in the beginning, if you need to take on other deals, you go ahead and do it. And I think sometimes that like people are a little bit self-conscious about, uh, you know, when it comes into positioning and messaging tend to maybe are a little bit more constrained than they need to be or, or self-conscious. You know, I often find that is, you know, people, people don't want to be as as what you just said there don't want to be as direct as like you know we are the we are the best fit so you know tend to end up being a little bit more nuanced and then kind of floating back into the crowd yeah i mean ultimately that comes from a place of insecurity right mm -hmm. they they don't want to be very clear about who they do it for and what they do and the outcomes and the results that happen on the back of that work because they're insecure. There's a lack of confidence, there's a lack of certainty. And so they hedge, they hedge their words, they hedge their message, they hedge their promise down to a point where they feel comfortable, but also to a point where their message is now completely irrelevant to anybody and nobody cares enough to pay attention. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. So when you work, when you work with your clients, how do you get them to that position of being, being able to really express, you know, their, their, their proper message, their power message to have the confidence to put that forward into the marketplace? So, so to us, confidence is a byproduct of power positioning, right? So we don't mm -hmm. want you to go to a market and make some big, bold claim that you're not confident backing up that you don't right. have certainty and that you don't feel as an alignment. So it's first and foremost defining with three pillars of the process when it comes to power positioning. First and foremost, defining what we call client clarity. 
you know, who you're going after, who's it for, right? And if you have no prior experience working in a market, probably not one that you should enter right away, right? Especially if you mm -hmm. need to make it work, right? So yeah, yeah. typically you want to go to the market that you have the most familiarity in. The reason why I serve consultants is because that's pretty much all I know. I'm a consulting lifer, did the big firm thing, did the boutique firm thing, started my own practice. I don't really know, like to put me in a room full of e-commerce business owners and I'm fish out of water. I don't know what to say, what to do. Couldn't have that conversation, right? Mm -hmm. So I went to a market that I'm very comfortable with. That's the first piece is client clarity, right? That builds in some comfort, some confidence. The second piece is what we call problem specificity. That's getting really, really clear on the specific problem that you solve for those clients because nobody's going to believe that you're world-class at everything and that you can solve all their problems, right? And again, to the extent that you have direct experience solving that problem, you're going to be more confident in addressing that and speaking to that with the client. The third piece is what we call the point of view. The point of view is your articulation of why the client has struggled to get results in the past and why your offer is different and unique. And there's always something there, but our clients typically aren't clear on what it is. And when they get that clarity, confidence comes out of that exercise as well. Yeah, no, it's 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 interesting what you just said there at the, at the end, because when you are so involved in it, uh, when you're so involved in your business, when you're really down in the weeds, sometimes it's hard for people to see what it is that they do really, really well. I mean, it's like that unconsciously competent thing sometimes. Like, And I think having somebody like you who can help them to articulate that or really hone in on what it is they do really well, I think that that's probably a real light bulb moment on, on, often for some of the business owners. Well, it just happened this morning. We were working with a seven-figure consulting firm in the digital innovation space. And they have an offering that's very, very good, very proven. We're working on the positioning. And they came up with a list of outcomes. And they said, these just don't, they don't sound right. They don't resonate. And it was a quick five, 10 minute conversation. I, you know, really what I did was I got them to talk about their offer. And I asked them, what do your clients actually want? Forget your consulting speak, forget how you, because mm -hmm. usually where people go, go wrong is they look at the problem and the solution from the consultant's lens. You've got to look at it from the client's lens. So what I asked them was when, when clients go through your offer, what do they actually want? What are the outcomes and the results they're looking for? And once we got the client to talk about what their clients actually want, all kinds of language came out that was far more powerful and resonant and relevant to their market. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a fantastic example because I do think that, uh, you know, people get so, you know, naturally enough uh, wrapped up in your service or your product or whatever it is you're selling because it's your baby and it's everything and forget about the fact that the minute you go out into the marketplace, it doesn't matter what you decided your product was going to do. It doesn't matter what you decided your service is going to do. It's how customers use it that really matters. Yeah, hundred percent. Our mantra is you fall in love with the market, not with your solution, right? Falling in love with the solution is going to ultimately uh, make you stale, irrelevant and behind the times, right? Falling in love with the market makes you adaptable, resilient, no matter where the market shifts, because the market is dynamic. It's always mm -hmm. changing. There's always shifts you're going to be well prepared to adapt to that change because the market is your priority, not your solution. Yeah, and, and part of that is, and I think this is where uh, you know, people often fall down as well, is, is that, uh, you know, once they're in a market, once they have their, you know, positioning and that they, you know, they tend not to spend enough time watching their customers and seeing and talking to their customers and seeing if there's any evolution there because let's face it everything is dynamic nowadays and things are changing so rapidly that you have to be constantly checking in and making sure that you're staying in in lockstep with your customer or your customer maybe is evolving maybe the way they do things is changing maybe the pandemic has changed how they do things there's lots of there's lots of things and i think sometimes once you go through an exercise there's a temptation to say great done that move on to the next thing um but i presume like you know with your with your clients there's a there's a an ongoing evolution process yeah, it's interesting because I think one of the mistakes that consultants, experts, advisors make is they they relegate themselves to a transaction. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just come in and I just do this one thing. And that may be transactionally true. But if you don't consider the broader transformation the client is going through, you're going to leave a lot of value on the table, right? Your transaction is the, the, is the first domino to fall, so to speak. Clients come in and work with us right? They go through the 90 day pipeline, they dial in positioning, they dial in lead generation, they dial in their mechanisms, BD, right? That's just the first domino where it's not done. Their transformation is just kicking off. 
And we're now, frankly, getting better at capturing those stories, you know, six months out, mm -hmm. 12 months out, two years out. And we're always kind of astonished at what's happened in that time frame. And when you consider the broader context of the customer's journey, your transaction is one small piece that kicks off a massive transformation. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because um, I mean, I can imagine during this process, like, as you said, I mean, there's lots of things that lots of byproducts that come out of it, lots of other um, ideas or strains that you can that you can follow into. But you're correct. I do think that and I think it's 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 on the side of the consultants, also on the side of the buyers uh, often is that they do think as well as like, oh, I'll bring in a mod for a month and he can help us and every fix everything and then we're good to go. I think there's an education process there, too. Yeah, I mean, you've got to consider how much time you want to spend with a client as well, right? I mean, the, the, the way we look at it is the, your level of expertise is inversely correlated with how much time you want to spend with a client. So there's some consultants who will, you know, they, they want to be embedded in the client's organization. They want to spend a year, two years, three years, six months, whatever it may be working with the client. And that's fine. But if you have a high level of expertise and you're really sought after in the marketplace, you don't want to be that well entrenched with a client. You want to be in and out because, you know, for experts, the most interesting piece of the puzzle is when the situation is very messy. Right. When there's a lot of chaos and disarray and the client has no idea what to do. That's where experts can come in and really deliver transformational value. And if that's what you do and you're that level of an expert, you want to be in and out pretty quickly. And that goes back to what you were saying earlier about, uh, you know, being very aware of the problems that you solve, the specificity and who your ideal client is and what your ideal engagement is, quite frankly, because as you just pointed out there, there is two very different approaches. Like one, maybe you, know, you want to have a handful of clients and you want to be like 100 percent embedded there for, for a long period of time. Or as you say, you want to have a lot of clients, but um, you know, be in and out rapidly because of that, because you can make a big impact and then and then move on. So that gets back to the whole specificity thing, right? Yeah, and I'll I'll, I'll use myself as an example. You know, for a very mm -hmm. long time, for years, uh, as a consultant, I would go in and I would I would sink my teeth into a client's organization and I would just stay. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, and it's like months and months and months and, and that yeah. was the business model is a retainer model mm -hmm. and as long yeah. as you keep paying me i'm going to keep showing up we're going to keep doing this work right and what i realized was that the longer those engagements lasted the less interested i became because it got a yeah. little bit dry and mundane and think mm -hmm. and i had solved a bunch of problems for them which made the work less interesting and what i realized was that i thrive on the earlier part of that process where you don't have positioning you don't have clarity we don't have clear messaging those are the problems i love to solve and that's when, you know, I sat back and said, well, why don't I build a program that delivers that for a larger volume of clients and have them come in, solve these problems and then walk away. And that's been a big game changer for us. Yeah. And it's, and it's interesting that you mentioned that because I'm sure the, the longer that a consultant stays in an organization, you know, embedded there, there's a danger that they start to lose part of the power, which is the independent outside. Because I mean, sure, if you're staying embedded in a company for a year or two, you're kind of almost like an insider at that stage and maybe your objectivity isn't as great as it once was. The most powerful thing you can say to a client as a consultant is, I don't wanna be around forever mm -hmm. and I don't want you to be reliant upon me. So when clients come to work with us and they engage in the 90 day pipeline, they say, well, can we work with you after 90 days? And we say, maybe there's ways that we can do that, but actually we've designed this thing so that you're self-reliant and self-sufficient and you don't need us or anybody else to generate deals for you. And they go, wow. And that makes them trust you, right? Because they know that you're not going to try to finagle them into some long-term relationship that never ends. They know that your, your agenda is to get in and get out and install a capability. And that builds a ton of trust. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that absolutely. And it sounds to me like that uh, the, the work you do, is, especially with, um, you know, with helping consultants to find their work, I think this is obviously critical because I can see, and I know from my own experience and and from other people, I can see how it's very easy to kind of get lost as a consultant, you know, to go out all very enthusiastic and then get lost and maybe end up settling for just a handful of a handful of clients. But the way you have done it here is, as you said, I mean, you've you've set up this program, you've set up this defined engagement that delivers these things. And I think that that the, the preciseness of that is something that I think other people could certainly look at. Absolutely. Yeah. So what is, uh, what has been the, uh, just to be, before we end, um, have you a couple of examples, you don't have to name names, a couple of examples of clients that went through this process and just anything, anything that really surprised you about the outcome where you went, wow, that was even beyond my expectations. 
Well, I'll tell you what, we've recently, in actually preparation for a launch of one of our new podcasts, we've recently been interviewing some clients that have worked with us 6, 12, 24 months ago, and we've been profiling their story and their journey. And, and this is now outside of the transaction. You know, we're not really talking about our work together. Specifically, we're talking about the, the broader journey. And what I found really interesting about those conversations so far, and it's been a really clear theme that's emerged, is there's there's like two worlds the client uh, has described to me. There's pre-positioning and there's post-positioning. And pre-positioning, they're talking about it was hard to get attention, didn't know who they're going after, um, didn't have a clear message, weren't very confident, revenue was sporadic. Um, they're being perceived as order takers and commodities. And then post-positioning, they had all kinds of reputation and authority in the marketplace. They were able to command premium fees. Clients were paying those fees. They weren't getting ghosted. And it was like this, and, and as someone who teaches positioning, even it was, it was startling for me. I, I didn't even realize the extent of the change because I saw the piece while we were working on it, but I didn't always mm. see the aftermath and, as they moved on because these clients, to my point, became self-sufficient and didn't need us anymore, right? And uh, it was jarring for me to, to just see the, the shift from this, I want to call it simple, but not easy exercise of dialing and positioning. That's been a, a really clear theme that's emerged. Yeah, no, I, I, it's a great way to finish. Thank you, Ramon, because and I'm glad you said this, this, the simple, not easy, because I do think that sometimes people confuse the two, but simplicity, you know, simplicity is one of the hardest things to achieve, and it takes an awful lot of hard work to get to simple. 100%. Yeah. Well, listen, Ahmad, this has been great. Thank you so much. All of Ahmad's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, go please do tell us a little bit more about, uh, about you and your company. Yeah, I mean, real simple. We have a flagship program called the 90 Day Pipeline. And in that program, in the 90 days, we dial in your positioning, your messaging, your thought leadership, your lead generation systems, and your business development processes so that you know how to go to the market create demand, attract attention, and turn that attention into revenue. So if that's interesting to you, if you're a consultant, professional service provider, you can check out the details there at 90daypipeline.com. Yeah, absolutely. And I would encourage people to check it out. I know a lot more people are are, are striking out on their own, are going into consultancy, um, going into contract work or whatever. So I would absolutely encourage people to check it out. Uh, the more work you can do up front, it'll save you a lot of heartache in the long run. Absolutely. All right. All right. So thanks, Samad. Thank you for watching and listening. And I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks, John.